All right. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you again for um, Tavi for organizing this seminar series. And um, um, yeah, um, so as um, Tavi said, um, I'm now a assistant professor in um, the Department of Geophysics in Stanford. Uh, and before joining Stanford, I was a assistant professor uh, in the geoscience department uh, in Princeton. So um, I studied the dynamics and mechanics of ice. And um, today I'm going to talk about um, inferring Antarctic ice shell geology with deep learning. Um, I hope I can convince you today that there are lots of uh, new emerging um, opportunities and questions at the intersection between data and models um, and data-driven approaches. And um, so most of the contents I will talk about today are unpublished. And um, I just want to start with acknowledging my group members. Um, the most of the work I'll talk about today is done by uh, my postdoc Yang Jun Wang, and um, he has been uh, tremendous. Uh, the project would not be um, possible without uh, Yang Ji's uh, leading the work. Okay, and this is just this is a logo um, of my group uh, created by my uh, students and postdoc. Uh, it represent. Um, so here we have um, this represent. A combination of um, ice uh, and cracks, surface and basal crevasses, and a uh, fully connected neural network. So it represents our interest in um, ice mechanics and uh, scientific machine learning. All right, so um, let's get started. Um, we know that uh, to predict the dynamics of um, ice shelves and ice sheets, we need to um, consider uh, the conservation of mass the conservation of momentum, uh, which mostly comes from the balance between the gravitational driving stress and the viscous deformation of the ice. Importantly, we also need to de um, describe the ice rheology, which um, describe how um, ice flows in response to stresses. And um, we know that uh, when we um, solve for the ice equations, we start from the Stokes equations. And then because the ice is um, um, long and thin, uh, we can do a depth average um, um, to uh, the Stokes equation and uh, um, arrive at this um, shallow shelf approximation equation that was um, obtained by uh, Morland and uh, McHale. So um, this set of equation has been uh, widely used uh, to uh, make predictions of uh, the dynamics of ice shelves. And um, if we look closely, um, this shallow shelf approximation in involves the velocity and uh, thickness um, and densities. And these are the quantities that we can measure. Um, however, it involves uh, ice effective viscosity. And this is a quantity that is impossible to measure um, at least at a continental scale. So this is a property that we are interested in. And um, just to clear clarify the definition, uh, when I mentioned the effective viscosity, um, this is the coefficient between the stress tensor and the strain rain tensor. Uh, we know that the, the knowledge of uh, viscosity is crucially important for the prediction of ice dynamics. And uh, um, many of the literature has used the uh, Glenn's flow law, which assumes that stress and strain rate follows a power law relationship. And that's e equivalent uh, to saying that effective viscosity um, obeys a power law relationship with the effective strain rate. So the Glenn's flow law um, is um, based on this uh, laboratory experiment, and um, this demonstrate that the strain, uh, the measured strain rate and stress, um, approximately follow a power law, and the fitted um, exponent um, is about uh, n equal to three. Also, this um, prefactor of this um, power law relationship depend on temperature. However, we know that the rheology of um, glacial ice can be much more complicated. Um, in particular, this prefactor uh, can depend on pressure, um, impurities, uh, grain size, and this um, effects can be coupled uh, together and it can be difficult to untangle the effects of each. Moreover, um, we know that in a uh, realistic um, um, parameter range, uh, the strain rate can be as small as um, 10 to minus 3, um, 1 over a year. And this is a time scale that is um, challenging to reproduce in a laboratory. So the rheology of glacial ice has been um, widely debated for over 60 years. And last year, um, there's um, this um, elegant um, paper by um, Milstein, Minchu, and Pegler that uh, uses remote sensing observations to reassess the flow law of glacial ice 
here they um, calculate the strain rate uh, from velocity measurement and calculate the effective stress from uh, from the thickness of ice using this um, simple formula. And then a bit of parallel to this stress and strain rate um, data to show that uh, the stress exponent um, is closer to four um, in the fast flowing areas. Note that this, this calculation assumes a uh, one dimensional unconfined uh, ice shell flow. And that's why in this analysis, they focus on the regions that are approximately in, in pure one dimensional uh, extension. Uh, here, we are more interested in the rheology of the ice in the buttressed ice shelf area where the velocity field deviates from a simple one-dimensional setting. Uh, in fact, in these um, buttressed um, areas, the, the flow is two-dimensional and there doesn't exist any explicit expression uh, for the stress. So uh, to calculate the stress, we need to numerically um, um, solve for the two-dimensional flow dynamics. Okay. And uh, uh, another point I want to make is that um, instead of assuming a um, parallel rheology, we also want to um, take a step back and assess if we can just leverage the data that we have to um, learn the, the rheology model, to learn the, real, the viscosity structure uh, without assuming any um, parallel expressions. Okay, so, so what kind of data do we have? Uh, we have the velocity measurement um, and we have a thickness um, from um, that machine. So our goal is to find the um, viscosity field that along with this velocity and thickness um, satisfy the um, shallow shell approximations. And here, uh, Yangji led the development of a physics informed neural network for the ice viscosity inversion. So here, uh, the physics informed neural network not only fits the observed um, velocity and thickness, but also fits the shallow shell um, equations that governs the two dimensional ice flow dynamics. Um, basically, what the neural network um, is doing is that uh, we um, that we use a neural network um, to represent uh, the velocity, thickness, and viscosity field. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, we have the input of a neural network as the spatial coordinate, and the output of neural networks are uh, the quantities that we're interested in, such as the viscosity field, um, the velocity field, and um, thickness. Uh, we can do this because uh, it has been proved that uh, neural networks are universal function approximators. So uh, we can train a neural network to learn to approximate um, these fields of data. And then uh, once we um, use the neural network to represent um, these quantities, uh, we can substitute um, these quantities into the shallow shelf equations and uh, calculate the, the equation recipe. So we know that the viscosity, velocity, and thickness satisfy exactly the equation if the equation residues are zero. And in addition, we also have some um, stress balance um, that, uh, that we need to be, need to be satisfied uh, near the ice front, and that's also included uh, in our neural network training. So essentially, uh, the, what we're trying to do is to minimize uh, this cost function. Uh, the first part of the cost function um, is called the data misfit, uh, where we minimize the difference between the neural network approximated velocity and thickness uh, and the observations. And the second term is the equation misfit, where we try to minimize uh, these residues um, in the equation as well as um, the stress balance condition near the cutting front. So um, the physics in neural network has been um, applied to um, learning isology um, in the context in this um, paper by Ryan and Minchu, where uh, they assume this Glenn's full law, and then they were trying to infer the uh, ice hardness, uh, the B parameter. Um, so you can see that this is the, the result they got, and then it overall looks pretty good. And again, here, um, instead of uh, assuming a parallel rheology, what we want to learn is the, the, the fundamental parameter, the um, effective viscosity. So uh, here, uh, Yangji trained a physics informed network to learn the velocity and the thickness field that closely approximate the observed velocity and thickness data. Then we evaluate how well the neural network prediction satisfy the shallow shelf equations. So we substitute this um, velocity and thickness and viscosity field back into the equations. And the mismatch between the neural network prediction with the observations and the equations will be penalized in the cost function. And this will be used to update um, the uh, neural network predictive 
velocity, viscosity, and thickness field until they are consistent with both the observations and the uh, equations. So uh, to check that this methodology works, uh, we test the framework with some uh, synthetic examples. Uh, here is a um, um, simulation of an idealized um, eye show where uh, we have um, the data of the velocity uh, that varies spatially, and we have the thickness data that also varies spatially. So we take the velocity and thickness data to train uh, this um, physically informed neural network. And we show that um, in this idealized example, uh, we can use the physically informed neural network to infer uh, the ice effective viscosity uh, without um, explicitly inputting the viscosity data as a training data. So this inferred viscosity agrees well uh, with the ground truth uh, viscosity field. And again, um, in this approach, uh, we do not assume um, Newton Newtonian uh, rheology. Um, so here, the viscosity can vary uh, with space. OK, so now we move on to the real observations. Here we have the velocity and thickness data on the MRI shell. Um, and first, we confirm that the neural network can approximate the velocity and thickness field. And then by solving the shallow shock equation, uh, the neural network predicts the ice effective viscosity, uh, which again, we cannot directly measure uh, in the field. And because we don't have any training data for the viscosity itself, uh, this prediction is only possible because we include uh, these um, equations uh, during the neural network training. So the output of this um, approach is a two-dimensional field of ice, uh, ice e effective viscosity. And we can substitute this back to the equation um, to find that uh, the equation residues are about two orders of magnitude um, smaller than the terms uh, in the equation. So the errors of these inversions are pretty small and quantifiable. OK, so now we have the effective viscosity field. Uh, there's a lot we can do with this. We can test the uh, commonly assumed parallel rheology. Um, so we can do, uh, we can first uh, get the um, strain rate just from the velocity field. And then we can calculate the uh, stresses uh, based on the viscosity we infer. And then uh, what we did is we pick a flow line along the emery ice shelf. Um, so this flow line passes through a, um, initially passes through a compressive area and then travels towards a uh, extensional area. And this is also the area where we see lots of um, big crevasses. So we plot the stress and strain rate um, along this um, flow line. And the interesting thing we see is that if we um, just narrow it down to this uh, compressive area, uh, we see that the stress and strain rate relationship uh, and this uh, dots are the data we get from the inversion. So this um, exhibit uh, excellent agreement with the power law rheology and the best fit um, give us an exponent that's about one. And then we can show the robust robustness by um, uh, doing the same uh, analysis for nearby flow lines. Uh, in fact, you can um, probably get a, sim a similar result if you use the, the classical adjoint method, but then um, if you um, enforce the prefactor to be, uh, um, you have to find a region where the prefactor is approximately constant, then you can ask what the um, um, stress exponent is. The interesting thing is if we look into this um, extensional area, uh, we find that um, the power of rheology doesn't seem to be a good description of the inversion data. Uh, we see that um, you can have increasing strain rate without substantially increasing the stress. And this um, 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 is uh, resemble the plastic, perfect plastic rheology. So we can do this um, inversion uh, many times to test the sensitivity to the method, to the method um, um, details. And we can see that um, there's a consistent difference between the um, power law behavior in the compressive zone versus the non-power law behavior in the extensional zone. Next, uh, to confirm uh, the rheology um, um, in other areas, we um, detect uh, and the, we do the same analysis uh, in other compressive zones in the Fritschner, uh, Ross, and Nansen eye shelves. So all these result, all these areas show a clear uh, power law rheology uh, with stress exponent uh, that ranges from uh, two up to four. Uh, uh, generally, the higher uh, stress correspond to the larger stresses. So previously, um, Goldschmidt and uh, Kochstadt um, showed experimentally that ice can exhibit, exhibit different stress exponent under different creep mechanisms. 
And the rheology of ice can be described by a composite um, rheology model, where the first term uh, is a result of grand boundary sliding, and the second terms come from the dislocation creek contribution. So here in this expression here, uh, we have uh, the A, uh, the Q, um, the R, they are constants uh, that can be determined from experiments. And then we have the temperature uh, that can be estimated from, from the um, temp from the rock mold um, climate model. So the only thing we do not have is the, the grain size. So this is the only um, three fitting parameters that we, we do not already know. Next, we can um, take a look at one of the um, compressive regime um, in the Larsen Seek ice shell. So again, this is the circle dots here are um, the our inversion result. And uh, from a best fit uh, to this um, data, we see that the um, best fit of the stress exponent is about two, and that agrees quite well with the um, exponent uh, in the grand boundary sliding um, term. Moreover, uh, we can estimate that the theoretical contribution of this second um, term, the dislocation creep term, um, in this particular regime is negligibly small um, compared to the observed strain rate. And this suggests that the dominant creep mechanism in this regime is grand boundary sliding, and that's consistent with our inferred um, stress exponent as about two. So if we neglect the second term, and just fit um, the data to this um, first, um, the grand boundary sliding term, we can get um, the, um, the fitting parameter, that's the, the, the grand size, and that's about uh, one millimeter. And we can do repeat the same analysis for all the other areas. Um, so this is the, uh, um, the um, stress and strain rate relationship on the Fletchner ice shell, uh, and we can get the uh, fitting parameter of the grand size, that's about similar uh, magnitude, uh, one millimeter. And now we look at a different flow line on the Ross ice shelf. Um, so in this, in this region, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, we see that the contribution of the dislocation creep start to become important when the uh, stress is larger. So we no longer can neglect um, the second term, um, especially um, in the location where the stresses are large. And that partially uh, can explain the, the, the uh, changing um, exponent um, along this um, data set. So if we fit the entire the data to the composite flow wall, including both the first and the second term, uh, we can get the uh, grain size that's about uh, four millimeter. So finally, uh, on the Nansen ice shelf, uh, we found a uh, compressive area uh, that is under um, very high stresses. So in this area, the stress is about um, 300 k Pascal. And th in this area, uh, the um, the contribution of the dislocation creep um, dominate. And uh, we see that the data is well captured by um, the dislocation creep term with a um, stress exponent that's closer to four. And we know that um, in this uh, dislocation creep um, term, um, you know, there's no grand size being involved, um, but we can estimate the grand size because under such a high stress, it's common to uh, assume that grand size can reach the steady state. Uh, in fact, Jack and Jim uh, publishes this paper um, um, that shows a semi-empirical relation between the steady state grain size and the stress. And based on the characteristic stresses um, that we observed uh, in this Nansen uh, region and this um, semi-empirical relationship, uh, we can find that uh, the steady state grain size in this area is expected to be about uh, one millimeter. We are also very lucky that uh, in this particular compressive area, there is actually um, ice core data, uh, and that shows the um, local average grain size um, in this area is about one millimeter, and that agrees quite well with our uh, expectation. Um, so this um, ice microstructure data is provided by our collaborator, uh, David Pryor. In comparison, um, so far we have a list of different uh, stress exponents that we get from the stress and strain rate relationships um, along different flow lines uh, in the compressive regions. And by fitting the stress and strain rate relationship to the composite rheology, rheology we can infer the uh, grain size, which is the only fitting parameter. And then using the um, list relationship published by Jack and Jim, uh, we can use the stress magnitude in different flow lines to estimate the um, steady state grain size, and that's um, in this column. Also very luckily, uh, we have one ice core 
ice core data available uh, on the Nansen ice shelf that gives the grain size that agrees quite well with the steady state grain size estimate on the Nansen ice shelf. Uh, in fact, um, we see that all of the um, in all of the um, grain size that's inferred um, in the using the compass rheology in the compressive zone, uh, these are all about the same order magnitude, so about one millimeter. The question left is why this um, pin in the neural network inferred grain size are slightly smaller uh, than the steady state grain size that's estimated from this Jack and June relationship. So um, David Pryor offered a very nice explanation here. Um, we know that ice experience very high stresses um, on the ice sheet and the flexure zone uh, when ice enter um, the ice shelf. So uh, this is the uh, area where the stress is very high and grain size prefer to recrystallize and follow the steady state um, size. And that's about uh, one millimeter based on the stress magnitude. However, uh, we know that when um, ice enter the ice shelf, uh, the stress drops substantially. Um, and that's the case uh, in these four regions. Um, so we see that uh, in this blue shaded region um, is the range of the stress drop um, in these four compressive areas when the ice passes the flexure zone and enter the ice shelf. Um, and we know that the time it takes for the ice grain to grow uh, to the steady state grain size is very long. Um, Approximately, if we want to double the grain size from one millimeter, it can take up to a hundred to a thousand years. Therefore, the grain simply um, didn't have enough enough time to grow back to its steady state um, size and stays in this uh, magnitude as about one millimeter. Yeah. So, um, why is it important uh, to think about stress exponent? Um, here, I found this uh, nice um, diagram from the preprint by Mekana and Minchu. Uh, and this shows that um, how if when n changes, uh, it can affect the grounding line flux as well as the st stability of the grounding line position. So in this particular example, um, we can see that by changing the n from three to two or four, uh, we can remove the unstable grounding line, and you can, you may not have the um, actually collapse uh, even on the retrograde slope. Um, so this is quite important um, to. Um, to be able to know precisely what, uh, what stress exponent and what rheology um, is, um, is um, described the, the, the data best uh, near the ground environment areas. All right. Okay, so, so far we have been um, looking at rheology for um, isotropic um, ice shelf. Another interesting question is whether um, the viscosity should be isotropic. So uh, here is the, um, the isotropic viscosity um, inversion. Um, the, the red is higher viscosity and the green is lower viscosity. Um, we know that we, when we substitute it back to the um, equations, we can quantify the, the equation residues. And we see that in the compressive areas, um, the residues are pretty small. Um, however, when we go uh, look at the areas closer to the carbon front, um, uh, we start to have a, a slightly larger um, residues. Um, and it makes us wonder whether this could come from the fact that the equations might not be consistent with the observations. So uh, we go back to uh, look at the um, equations that we used. And um, um, again, this is the equation for the isotropic um, viscosity. Um, so we know uh, when we say isotropic viscosity, uh, what, what I mean is that uh, the, uh, we just have one single viscosity that, don't, that determine the relationship between the stress and strain rate um, in different components. Um, in this particular example, we have two equations, the shallow shelf uh, equations. Uh, we just have one unknown, so one viscosity. Therefore, the problem is actually over constrained. If we want to consider uh, full anisotropic uh, viscosity, uh, we can have you know up to many unknowns uh, that that we cannot, we don't have enough equations uh, to determine. So um, this problem is actually uh, under constrained. In order to uh, determine the um, uh, viscosity. Um, we can only have up to two uh, different viscosity parameters to determine. So um, this, uh, so how how do we determine uh, what uh, what kind of viscosity we want to um, infer? If we look at an ice shelf, um, we know that uh, there are large crevasses, so surface or basal crevasses, uh, that can um, make it easier to um, 
um, for the ice to spread rather than um, it's easier to, to stretch the ice shelf compared to um, compressing it vertically because of the existence of these crevasses. And this, um, this kind of material is also called the orthotropic material. So the definition of orthotropic material is um, the material that has properties um, in three dimension um, that are different in three perpendicular directions. Uh, for example, um, for wood, uh, we know that the material property can be different between the axial and radial um, directions. So in the case of ice, uh, we know that there are all these um, large, large um, crevasses that um, are vertical. Um, and that gives us the inspiration that uh, it's possible that uh, it's much easier to uh, stretch the ice. Um, therefore, the horizontal viscosity should be quite different from uh, the vertical viscosity because of the existence of these cracks. And if we um, um, have this uh, NSOC, then we can uh, have two equations and two different uh, unknowns. Uh, we have the horizontal viscosity and the vertical viscosity. And we can, um, the problem become um, well constrained. So we can uh, have rewrite the shallow shelf equation, uh, including the horizontal and um, vertical viscosity, and then put it in our inversion. So this is a uh, anisotropic uh, viscosity inversion result. Uh, we can see the uh, the pattern of the horizontal viscosity uh, and the vertical viscosity, um, and then we can see that this um, sub substantially reduced the residues um, that we have near the carbon fund compared to uh, what we had for the isotropic viscosity. And uh, the exciting part is that uh, this viscosity seems to capture the suture zones. Um, so. Suture zones are uh, places where you can have ice that, that's splitted uh, due to ice rises and then merges um, after ice passes the ice rise. Um, so in the suture zones, um, the, there can be marine ice formed under um, the surface. Therefore, the ice um, can be much softer. And in this case, uh, we see that um, so in, uh, this dashed line here are the suture zones that are previously mapped um, by um, in the previous literature. And we see that it aligns quite well with um, the low viscosity area here. The uh, green-ish areas are the places with lower viscosity, and the red is an uh, area with higher viscosities. And then we can compare this with the previous uh, isotropic viscosity case, where um, you, you have some uh, low viscosity regime, but it doesn't align with the suture zone as well as the anisotropic uh, viscosity yield. Uh, another thing I want to point out is that the, we see these patterns of suture zones uh, is not a result of the thickness or strain rate um, spatial pattern. Um, you can see that the strain rate um, does not have the, you know, does not reflect this suture zone um, pattern and the, the thickness is also quite smooth. So uh, the, the fact that we are resolving this um, um, suture zones is really um, a result of the, the fact that the viscosity is low um, in those uh, areas. It's not because of thickness of strain rate. And we can do this for um, the Larsen, the Emery, and the, the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, again, these are the all the block lines are the suture zones that were um, reported in previous papers. Uh, and then we show that it generally aligns quite well with the low viscosity area that are uh, marked in the uh, greenish areas. Okay. So um, here, um, I want to point out that um, suture zones are quite important. Uh, it has been uh, emphasized in many papers before that um, the suture zones can terminate rift propagation uh, because of the, the low viscosity can avoid the st stress concentration needed to propagate the rift horizontally. Therefore, uh, if we want to predict the propagation of rift on ice shelves um, without representing the suture zones in ice sheet models, it will be quite difficult to um, be able to um, predict the suture zone and rift propagation interactions. All right. Okay. So, uh, so what have we learned? Um, we show that uh, in the compressive areas, um, generally the rheology uh, follow the composite rheology. Um, and previous uh, lab experiments show that uh, under different creep mechanisms, uh, we could have different uh, stress exponent. Here we showed. Uh, the field evidence that the composite rheology is um, is uh, is valid uh, on Antarctic ice shelves, and in the extensional zones, uh, the rheology appears quite uncertain. Uh, in fact, the viscosity appears to be anisotropic, 
um, the physical basis for the rheology in the um, essential zone remains an open question. And uh, one of the important thing to note is that there are lots of crevasses um, in this essential zone, and that can um, you know, breaks potentially break some of the assumptions that we use in um, um, in the inversion, such as a shallow shelf approximation, and um, the viscosity is likely not isotropic. So um, uh, moving forward, I'm very interested in understanding how these fractures um, leads to the viscosity uh, behavior, that the vis viscosity pattern that we see. And um, uh, in summary, uh, here uh, we use, um, we develop the physics informed deep learning method to infer the viscosity structure of ice shelves um, using the observations of uh, ice velocity and the thickness measurement. And uh, we um, showed that the inferred um, stress constraint rate relationship agrees quite well with the composite rheology. <clears throat> and in all of the locations <clears throat> that we look at, the grain size, the inferred grain size is about one millimeter um, in, in the compressive zones of ice shelves. We also showed that um, the low viscosity regimes correlate quite well with suture zones, and this is important for the prediction of uh, rift propagation. So moving forward, um, I'm interested in how uh, the crevasses um, um, create the um, um, uncertain behaviors of the viscosity that we see in the extensional zones. Um, and um, I'm also very interested in um, ice core data in the um, area that we, we already have the inferred brain size uh, for comparison. So if anyone have um, data, I'm really happy to chat about it. And uh, I want to finish by um, saying that we are looking for new members to join our group. So we are broadly interested in developing mathematical models to understand ice processes, and at the same time, to leverage deep learning technique to accelerate discoveries from cryosphere data set. So feel free to get in touch and send in your CV if you're interested in our positions. With that, I will um, stop here and take questions. Thank you very much, Yao. Um, do we have any questions for Yao? The way that we normally do this is we ask people to indicate in the um, chat uh, that they have a question. Um, and uh, then we get asked people to unmute and actually ask their question. Um, is there a question? Oh. Um, there's... Thanks for the comments. Roger, I'm really curious like if there are, yeah, if there any, anyone knows more ice core data that give the grain size um, measurement um, near near the areas that we're looking at, that would be, I'd love to hear that. Um, so we're starting to get some questions into the chat now, Yao. Uh, Roger Clark, would you like yeah. to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, th thanks very much for the talk. Um, smashing to see a picture of uh, my old friend Dave Pryor on there. I, I'm tempted to ask in, in if you've ever seen him not wearing shorts, <laughs> which I never have in 30 years, even in snow. Um, but serious question. I forget the slide number, apologies, but earlier on in, in the presentation, you were talking about using depth averaged temperatures. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is there's a bit of vertical variation. I wonder if you've got any comment on that? It's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, um, yeah, actually we, we are, uh, the temperature we are, um, so we have to assume a temperature profile. Um, and the, the the data we actually have is the surface temperature from from red ball, um clim regional climate model, and we assume that the the temperature at the base is uh, near the freezing temperature, and uh, in um, we have to solve the the diffusive um, thermal equations to get the um, temperature profile, but um, we we actually do not. I guess we, there are only, there are only a few places where we have actual temperature profile data to compare with our um, temperature profile calculation so so that is one source of uncertainty um but yeah in, in this in this case we are we we, we sort of cons consider the the variation of temperature through the assumed um depth variation the, the the temperature profile that we calculated um you'll be you'll be really great to have 
some observations uh, that constrain the profile temperature that we have. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Cheers. Yeah. Roland, um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Yeah. So thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Um, before I get to my question on this, this last point, um, unfortunately, the compressive zones of ice shelves tend to be right down near the grounding line, normally in Antarctica, a very long way to go. Um, but more generally, um, there's a rel relatively recent publication from our group here in Hobart that uh, summarizes the temperature situation for the Amory ice shelf, which possibly has more temperature profiles than uh, uh, than any other ice shelf. And so that may be of interest to you. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, the 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 question I have is well, I have two questions, partly about your identification of the compressive zone. Now I can understand that at the front of an ice shelf where the horizontal where the plan view stress field is is uh, tensile, then mm -hmm. there are a lot of nasty things like apparent necking, stretching of basal crevasses. Uh, actual rifts right through the shelf, and all of those things probably play into the effective viscosity that you're finding in those areas. But mm -hmm. in a much larger part of an ice shelf, um, my own experience is, is with uh, simulations for the Amory. Um, while it's true that the flow, that the horizontal flow regime you described goes from the compressive to extensive. Given that ice is incompressible, incompressible, I don't quite understand why the why the rheology should should change at that stage. Yeah, yeah. The so you are asking um, how do we interpret the the result in a extensional areas, right? Sort of why why is it? Um, yeah. Like, okay. I mean, the, the picture you had there of the Amory, for instance. Um, so okay, maybe we can go to the Emory picture, but but yeah, this is one of the one of the um, example of what what happens in the extensional zone, right? Like the the um, just the places where with where um, ice is, you know, there there could just be a small part of unbroken area um, um, in, near the top. Um, if if we had yeah. basal crevasses, um, maybe we go to the Emory. Well, you, okay, so that Amory, if the, you just go back, well, the, that Amory figure you just showed. Sorry, is, yeah. do you mean this one? Well, the, the, the... well this one would do fine. Um, so you're very narrowly, can, so you're showing the longitudinal strain rate, as soon as the strain rate long flow there. Um, right. First of all, um, there's very little sign of crevasse damage and so on in the first two thirds of of the, of the ice shelf. Um, so that's that's my first comment. The other thing I I would say, excuse me, is that this particular streamline that you've chosen goes through an extremely badly rifted region of the front of the ice shelf. It would be really interesting if you were to look at some. Uh, streamlines on the western side of the Amory. But what I wanted to focus on yeah. is the region where you've got longitudinal strain rate approximately zero. Like here, uh, like this yeah. area. Mm -hmm. are, are you just not getting any useful power law information because the strain rates are so small there? Um, what's happening there? So yeah, yeah. Actually, this this area as we correspond to this transitional transition area. Um, so, uh, start starting from the upstream compressive area, we 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 have this power wall, and then it started transition to towards. Um, so so I guess this area you can call it power wall, but the the stress the exponent is increasing as the flow, you know, yeah. as the ice flows downstream, and at some point there, I think what this this plot, uh, I, so fracture is probably one. Um, 
you know, like it, it, it's it's one of the potential reason um, that that we that we um, you know basically we, we couldn't we couldn't see stress keeping keep increasing as the strain rate increased. Yeah, I agree. Um, then, I mean, it could be you um, could, could could think of it as damage. Yeah. The stress based damage effect. Yeah, basically, I think what what this says, um, and and I'm you know open to many um, interpretations, but what this says is that there's a limitation, a limited um, stress that ice can sustain. You know, like the you can you yeah. can increase the strain rate by right? when you measure the strain rate, um, it increase um, spatially um, downstream, um, but then um, you know when the stress is too large. I think one positive thing that happens is that when the stress is large enough, you know, you, you create fractures. They, they, those can be small fractures as well. You know, small pre-existing fractures being being in, enlarged because stress is large enough. Um, but but it, it's you know the it looks like you, you cannot you cannot have a strain rate increase. You cannot just have stress stress that keep increasing. The stress has to be bounded. Um, and you know one of the potential mechanisms that bound the stress is fracturing. But maybe there are other reasons. I, yeah. I think you're right. Like this area, actually, we don't see very large crevasses. So, so there could be maybe there are other other factors that that sort of bound the the stress um, so that it doesn't increase your strength rate. Right. Thank you, Abby. I had a second question, but I think other people are in the queue, so I've got Abby to come back for a second bite. Okay, let's, let's go to Tim Hill, and then we'll come back to you, Roland. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks Yao for the talk, that was really interesting. Um, my question is about the physics informed neural net itself and that you said it doesn't need any training data. Um, I found that a little surprising. Um, my understanding of these is that you're sort of using the neural net as a function approximator for the governing equations. So in that case, what's the benefit of doing that recasting versus something like an inversion with finite element methods? So I think you have, yeah, you have two questions, actually. The first one is it doesn't require training data, right? Um, yeah. But uh, it, it does require training data for, for the velocity and thickness. Okay. So, so we, we, without velocity and thickness, the, the inversion, you, you, you just cannot solve for the um, viscosity. Yeah, the only thing we do not have training data for is the viscosity. Okay. Um, right. Um, and, uh, okay, so you asked the second question about uh, finite um, sort of their um, that can we do the same same you know same task uh, with a you know a join a join methods or um, some some other method that that can solve our inverse problem? Uh, that's an excellent question, and um, uh, you know in my view there are two um, like I think depend on the the particular problem you're interested in. Um, there are, I think two 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 points that makes. This this method different from the classical methods. The first one is um, the part I'm particularly interested in is to detect the mismatch between the inconsistencies between equations and observations. So you know in the finite uh, in a let's say the the classical inverse method, you you almost certainly assume the equations are a hundred percent correct, and then you blend all the problems to the data. So you have you basically you you try to fit let's say the viscosity such that, you know, you minimize the predicted velocity from the finite difference um, solver with observed um, velocity. Here we can, um, you know, we can, we, can, we can gauge what type of equation um, explain the data, the data best because we can, you know, we can evaluate um, the, the residues. We can evaluate how well the predicted velocity and viscosity um, fits the um, satisfied equations. Um, I think you can actually do similar things uh, with finite element, element. I just have not seen people doing that. Um, sort of testing what equations um, makes makes best sense, uh, mostly consistent with with data. Um, the other thing is um, we the, this method is particularly is not that sensitive to the regularization technique. Um, for example, here is a is a example we have. So here we we take the training uh, synthetic example. Uh, we we ask the question of how does uh, so the neural network can infer viscosity based on some noisy measurement of velocity? So it's doing denoi denoising and inversion at the same time, and then we 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 do the same thing with a classical control method, and um, we without any regularization method, and then you can see actually the, the noise can um, 
you know, it can, can, can affect the inversion result quite a bit. Um, um, that being said, I think this can be tackled by many existing regularization methods. Um, you just need to do more, you just need to be skillful of um, how to regularize the predictions. Uh, for, for our, in our experience for the pin, you can, it's not that sensitive to the noise uh, in the data. But, but I'm not aware of a comprehensive comparison of the two methods. And I think that's some, something I'm very interested in working on. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much. I think that slide with the smoothing in addition to the inversion is pretty convincing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Want to go ahead, Roland? Yes, thanks, thanks Terry. The, the other topic which I was excited to see you uh, approach uh, in terms of uh, going beyond the scale of rheology, um, uh, I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, I think that, that there's uh, a topic of ice rheology that, that, that's missing there, which ice shelves are, are in fact an ideal place to study, which is that it's generally accepted that ice deforms much more rapidly in simple shear than it does under normal extensive and compressive stresses, maybe by a factor of 10. And um, I think that's be a much more fruitful um, might be a particularly fruitful thing to look at in your Amory simulations because the that the Amory has a very high, very well defined high shear zone. And uh, our group in Hobart has been working on this aspect of uh, a lot of trouble with some reviewers. We have a scalar flow relation, but it is a scalar flow relation for anisotropic ice so that it knows whether the ice is being deformed uh, by simple shear or by normal stresses uh, because this affects the crystallography, which affects the deformation processes. It's great. What clear is, in fact, what's pretty clear is you can't really get away with a uh, a, a single viscosity parameter because you can certainly see crystallographic situations where the ice would be extremely deformable being uh, sheared but would be extremely stiff to being compressed or extended along that shear axis and mm -hmm. I think it would be really exciting to see that particular generalization of the uh, uh, viscosity tensor uh, as distinct from the um, the vertical versus horizontal case that, that that you've explored so far. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I I'm really excited that you you actually you bring this up. Uh, so you um yeah, like you you mentioned the, the effect of fabric. Uh, sorry, the crystallite. Um, yeah. You mentioned the she the the difference between um. The, uh, the difficulties in shearing versus compressing or stretching the material, right? Um, I think, um, I guess the, the places, so so far we, the flow line we pick is, um, there, there's mostly compressive and extensional um, stress that, that dominant the stress, the strain rate tensor. So the, the, the shear are pretty small, but, but yeah, I, I completely agree the, you know, the, in the places where there are large shear, um, I think there will be, you know, it's a proof. There are probably lots of uh, fruitful, um, you know, interesting questions uh, that, that we can do to think about. Um, yeah. Well, what you see in your lower figure there for the Amory is is low viscosities in the regions where the um, where the flow is dominated by by shear on the on the sides, and um, and of course, if she, if that's the dominant contribution, then it doesn't really matter too much. If the other stress is not there, it doesn't matter that you're using the wrong viscosity. But the situation is obviously going to get really complicated when you have uh, shear and and compression as to as to whether a scalar flow relation is is working. So I think it's exciting that you're already going beyond that that scalar case. Um, I mean, I have to say, I I did the attempted to do the viscosity for the Amory 20 years ago by the control method. 
and I got as far oh. as a conference presentation uh, and then I felt mm, this needs a little bit more improving the numerics and the understanding before you get any further so I'm I'm, I'm excited to see this 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 this, this coming back um, I was hoping to be able to discern the effect of the shear versus uh, normal compression on the uh, strain rates and I didn't actually have uh, enough data to resolve the point cloud that I had into into a decent fit on that but um, I, th I think that area of anisotropy is is certainly another uh, another interesting aspect of uh, uh, of ice flow anyway I've said quite I've said too much already no 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 this is this is awesome yeah well one thing we actually haven't done care um carefully yet is to distinguish um the 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 shear versus the extension the viscosity um in response to shear versus extension um that's an area i'm really interested in um to investigate moving forward um and and i think yeah you're you're right like in, in this area every area where we know um there are lots of shear happening near the margin are probably a good place to to start um yeah yeah thank you for thank you for the um suggestions and comments so roger you get uh, five and a half minutes to ask your last question <laughs> I'll talk really slow. Um, yeah, thank, thanks once again. I was wondering if if your results have anything to say about spatial variability, particularly anisotropy of seismic properties, like seismic velocity. I know there aren't that many places where we've been able to measure it in, in uh, cryosphere settings, but it is something that I know uh, a lot of people are, are, are trying to have a go at. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, and you know, like the the, so I have a, a chat. Like this is the only uh, the only time I have thought about this was um, when I chatted with a colleague. They told me you can use seismic measurement to get the um, I think to, to get the orientation of the crevasses. But but like I would, I would love to hear if there are. You know other properties that that the seismic um, measurements can offer that that could help us understand the spatial variability of viscosity because I, I haven't I don't have a good idea yet um, but I, I know that, that my colleague told me that you can get the orientation of the crevasses. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't for one moment suggest we can actually sort of map out the anisotropy of seismic properties all over every every piece of ice um, but people are certainly having a go at crystal orientations crystal fabric suggestions and so on uh, it's not an easy experiment to do but uh, i'm sure I, if you rattle dave Pryor's cage he'll have a he'll have a good chat with you about it that's that's what we talked about the last time he was back here in leeds which is where he's uh, he was originally uh, working i see so th does there exist a um, a map of the anisotropic um um oh. I, <laughs> I, think, I think there's there's barely even a map of actual isotropic oh. average velocities it's just that when when people do particular a uh, very few particular field experiments that that have been arranged to to measure an azimuthal variation um and a few cases measure vertical variation uh, we see things that are consistent with anisotropy um, yeah, without going into gory details, um, yeah, if if there's a variation in the uh, horizontal anisotropy, um, it acts as a reflecting surface between the isotropic and anisotropic materials. Some of the reflecting interfaces we see in ice have been suggested to be due to anisotropy. It it just just be nice to have anything that. Uh, and adds to the general landscape, as it were, of of understanding what might be going on there. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, like, to 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 some, those are like ground, like um, actual observations and uh, independent measure of anisotropic properties of ice, and it would be good to compare uh, with our viscosity map. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Th thank you once again. That's great. Thank you. So uh, 
I have to say a huge thank you again to Yao for a really fantastic talk today. Uh, and just to warn everyone that there is no seminar next week. So we've got a week off the seminars. I will put that on to um, Cryolist as well. Um, and then the following week, we are back, um, I think, with an early career set of talks. So a set of uh, talks from uh, three early career researchers. So uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Really yeah. interesting talk. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all for the uh, suggestions and feedback. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, cheers.